Live from Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering Mobile World Congress 2017. Brought to you by Intel. Okay, welcome back everyone to our special two days of coverage of Mobile World Congress 2017. I'm John Furrier here in the Palo Alto studios covering what's happening in Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, Spain. Of course, this is our day two of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, six, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. for two days. And of course, as we kick off our day two and get early morning here in, in California, or mid-morning, they're ending the day in Barcelona and all the news is dropping. And again, it's continuing the theme of 5G, IOT, and the notion of these super demos, all the flair and glam around IOT, AI, and everything else. And on the phone right now in Barcelona, Spain, is our friend and analyst with the Futurum Group, Scott Reynovich, who also be hosting, co-hosting with theCUBE at ONS, uh, Open Networking Summit, um, uh, longtime industry analyst, uh, guru in the space around mobile, certainly SDN and what's going on. Scott, welcome, and thanks for taking the time to call in from Barcelona. Thanks, John. Great to be here. And also, I might, I might uh, add some color to one thing you said. You said the day was winding down. Apparently in Barcelona, <laughs> the day never ends. It just goes. <laughs> All the way through. Well, the show is ending, but now the real action happens. All the hallway conversations at dinner, and certainly we know that you take a nap around this time and get ready to go out and burn the midnight oil till three in the morning. We have many stories from Barcelona, but let's get down to what's happened today in Barcelona. What's the big story? What are you seeing on the ground there? What's the vibe? Give us some uh, insight into what's happening, the experiences you're having, and what, what's the big stories today coming out of Mobile World Congress? Yeah, sure, John. Well, there's, as you know, there's a lot of hype about a lot of buzzwords. So you got to throw all the buzzwords out there, IoT, 5G, you know, self-driving cars, VR, AR, augmented reality. Um, if, you, if you run through the, the, the halls, you see a lot of these gizmos and gadgets. And I would say the, um, the scene has shifted a lot in recent years, as you know, a couple of years ago, it was all about you know Samsung's new tablet or uh, the latest phone, uh, and um, now it's more about these kind of more advanced technologies. I call them interactive technologies um, that we're going to see coming down the road in the next few years. So you, um, the, the so show has been a very stuff. The show has been very telco oriented. Still, it really is a device and telco show. Basically, the device guys had their their moment in the sun on Saturday and Sunday. You know, but Monday kicked off really the telco show, which is really about you know the telcos trying to figure out their future. Their core competency over the years has been how to provision subscribers and billing, and been trying to figure out the over the top. And now, as you look at the software that's coming out with the 5G plus the end to end, some of the things happening at the network transformation area. There's some real action happening. I want to just get your thoughts on, you know, is this the time where we're starting to see the, the needle move on the progress of really bringing, you know, the, the kind of networks that are going to power the cool technologies that are, and, and promises of use cases, whether it's eSports up to, you know, driving cars that are essentially data centers, uh, huge amount of data problems, huge amount of network reconfiguration. Is this the time where there's an inflection point? What's your thoughts? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a great point. Um, you, I mean, you have the the service providers for uh, a number of years have felt a little bit. Um, uh, I don't know what the word is. Is spurned by success. I mean, they they created all this plumbing and they they put this massive investment into uh, LTE and broadband and really enabled all these applications, but. Um, it was more people like uh, Apple and Netflix uh, and, and Amazon that kind of stole the show by leveraging that bandwidth for these new services, cloud services, you know, music services, uh, of course, Netflix, the most popular internet service in the world. Um, and so the service providers kind of feel like 5G is another opportunity that they don't want to squander. And so they're being very careful um, about how to position that, but to your point, um, they have realized that they absolutely need to virtualize their network because what, what's going to happen with 5G is you have this massive amount of bandwidth, but you need to slice it up into different, uh, you know, they call them actually network slices so that you can provide all these advanced services 
And that's where the service providers want to figure out, you know, how they're going to monetize that. So it's, uh, you know, it's certainly a launch pad for the, the, the technology, the, the somewhat maligned technology known as NFV, Network Function Virtualization. But I think the, the, the pressure to get 5G out is going to accelerate their investment in NFV because they need that cloud platform uh, to, to kind of serve up all these next generation services. Is the telco's NFV efforts going to make them more cloud ready in your mind? Is that the, uh, the sentiment? Is it that they have to kind of do a lot of things right now? Uh, and, and the question is, what are the use cases if they are cloud ready and they can get their, their act together, the network a a layer uh, to power these apps that are going to be running on 5G? So, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, they're, uh, they're, they're progressing. You know, AT&T makes periodic announcements that they've, you know, virtualized whatever it is, 30 or 40 percent of the network. And, and Verizon, I, you know, I heard from an interesting company, Radisys, um, which, uh, you know, recently got a $70 million contract from Verizon to install NFV uh, infrastructure. Now, that's not $70 million is a drop in the bucket in terms of capital spending, for, but for a small uh, virtualization, you know, platform company like Reddit, that's, that's a pretty big, uh, pretty big move. And so I think you're seeing this stuff finally becoming real. And they are going to have, I mean, what NFE will bring to them is, is a much more flexible platform. It's built based on the, the cloud web scale model, where you snap in a bunch of servers and all, this, all the networking is virtualized and you can move things around in the cloud and uh, they they want to take advantage of new services they can offer, whether that's, say, a virtualized uh, enterprise security service, you know, security service in the cloud, where you you go into the, the Verizon data center and you, you order it up and then they have a, a cloud security model that will protect you or, um, you know, other what we call virtual network functions. Another hot area you've probably heard of is SD-WAN. Yeah. There, there are a lot of SD-WAN services being rolled out. And what is that? That's a virtualized kind of WAN solution that doesn't require you to, say you have a bunch of branch offices around the world, you don't have to ship them all routers and then hook them up with, uh, you know, expensive lease lines. You can kind of plug them into the cloud, if you will. And, you know, there's a bunch of hot companies in that area, including, you know, um, Ariaka Networks, Fellow Cloud, Viptela, which are all um, mentioned as active kind of acquisition targets these days. So there's definitely still uh, a lot of virtualization talk going on, though I will say it took, it took the backseat to, this year it took the backseat to 5G and IoT. Yeah, great, great commentary. I got to say, I talked with Intel in an exclusive interview with Sandra Rivera from Intel GM, of the Communications Network Platforms Group, and you know we were talking about uh, the dynamics. And I think the big IoT thing has been the autonomous vehicles. Obviously, smart cities is you know you got some surveillance, you get cameras and stuff in towns and cities, and certainly the smart home. You can't you can't move a, an inch in the industry without hearing about Echo and Google, um, you know, in the home, kind of voice activated automation. And then you got a media and entertainment. You mentioned Netflix. You know, all these things are essentially coming back uh, to, you know, rear its data center-like environment. I mean, this is, this is like the data center meets consumer. And, you know, we were commenting that the, the autonomous vehicle is essentially a data center on wheels and that, you know, there's going to be trade-offs between, you know, low latency, high bandwidth and true mobility. You know, car is not going to be dictated by millimeter, you know, wave technology because, uh, you know, they might have different frequencies. So this brings up this diversity of network. And so I want to get your thoughts on how you see the market evolving with the pressure for open source software. You, know, you mentioned SD-WAN, software-defined WAN, software-defined radio, software-defined networks, software-defined data center. The whole world is software-defined. So the role of open standards, both on open source software, as well as open wireless, if you will, meaning not one vendor is going to own it. How do you grok that? How do you, how do you pull that picture together? And how do you advise your clients on, on what this actually means for them and their impact? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, you, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head with your question, because I spent much of the show uh, looking at all of the, uh, if you want to break it up into two, you know, buckets of things, you know, you talked about cl 
cloud enabling, so the infrastructure that builds the data center. But as you pointed out, this is a, this is a service provider show, so a lot of the uh, a lot of the discussions around connectivity standards, of course, um, and it, it's really amazing, John. It's amazing. <laughs> You know, we can boil these things down into these neat little buzzwords, IoT and 5G. But just this today, you know, uh, I you know talk to people about at least uh, five different forms of IoT standards. And, of course, 5G today was a super controversial topic. So let me just bite those off one by one. So with IoT connectivity, you have something called uh, LoRaWAN which is a, uh, a open standard, an IETF open standard. And uh, there's about 500 uh, members signed on to the LoRaWAN Alliance, including Cisco and IBM and Schneider Electric. So that has a fair amount of momentum. It has certain characteristics, very low bandwidth, but uh, and not, not real time. So it's, uh, I'll just give you one example. If you want a connected cow, John, I saw a connected cow, you know, and the, the idea is that you are, Running a massive ranch oper- operation, you want to you want to track your livestock, so you need a very low cost device that does that. That's an example. You also have um, so called NBIOT, which Cisco is pushing pretty hard. Narrowband IoT is another standard that's going to be used for IoT applications. You have the 3GDP working on LP WAN, which is kind of like a uh, a 2G recycled for IoT. You know, the characteristics of IoT are it has to be really cheap, and it has to be really low power. So you can't use LTE, right? So that's another one. And then you have a couple of hot, um, a couple of hot private companies, um, uh, Sigfox, which has you know, over a hundred million dollars of funding. It might even be hundreds of millions of dollars of funding, based in France. And another company called Ingenu, which is spun out of. Uh, the San Diego, um, you know, Qualcomm hotbed with a lot of really interesting IP. And they have a technology called RPMA. So those two companies are building networks worldwide based on proprietary standards. They, they've said, uh, we're going to build an IoT uh, a network, a radio network for IoT all over the world, but it's going to be based on our proprietary technology because that works better. Uh, so that, I just gave you IoT, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then you have 5G, which, uh, you know, dozens of service providers all announced different things about that and actually argued about, you know, 5G doesn't exist right today, <laughs> right? So you have, you know, Verizon rolling out a pre-standard uh, 5G trial, and then you have something called 5G NR, new radio, which is a, uh, a multi-spectrum flavor of 5G that... that that Qualcomm and Ericsson are fooling around with, and then you have people like Nokia saying, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, slow down! We we gotta we can't push uh, 5G before it's time. We don't want it to fragment. You know, we don't we don't want it to just splinter all over the place yeah. and you know pull like an Android." So I don't know. That was a mouthful, but if you, so, what does it kind mean? Of get the idea. It, so is how it is it these fork- buzzwords when you unpack them, they get really complicated. Is it forking? Is is five G essentially a land grab right now, or is this all part of the evolution in your mind? Because it does seem that you know you need a catalyst. Obviously, Intel's taking a leadership position. They've done a deal with Nokia. You've seen some Ericsson announcement, but then you got Qualcomm on the other side with Snapdragon. You know the competition between Intel and Qualcomm's at an all time high, certainly on the handset side. But at the end of the day, the network is the key at this point. And so the question is, you yeah, know, now, is, it, is 5G is going to be broken down by the forking? Grab. It's not a land grab. It's a hype grab. <laughs> <laughs> because 5G will not exist for at least, you know, they, they won't be rolling it out till 2020. And I heard several people argue today that it's really 2021. But um, so you can't, it's not a land grab until you're, it actually exists, right? So it's, it's all about positioning, you know, your, your marketing around it. But just to give you an example, one of the one of the uh, the controversies today was um, just accelerating. Should we accelerate 5G? And you, had, uh, you know, and then DT came out and said, "Well, we have to be careful because it's really expensive. 5G is actually going to be more expensive than LTE, and if you don't have the return on investment, 
you know, you're going to kill yourself. Well, so, Intel, Intel um, claims people, they're going to have five G. Scott, Intel claims they're going to have five G at the in Winter Olympics in Korea. That is what they told me on the record. Um, not sure if that is a trial network. Is that going to be um, just some yeah, base they'll, stations? Yeah, they'll have some form of five G. I mean, what I'm trying to point out with all these things is when somebody says the buzzword, it doesn't mean one thing, right? It yeah. means like yeah, it means like several things, and there will be there will certainly be pre-standard five G trials. I'm just saying right now we don't even know what that is. We don't. Nobody has even settled on what the spectrum is for five G. You know, there's there's like <laughs> been four different announcements about different spectrums, and then you have this five G NR thing, which is a multi-spectrum technology. So uh, it's really hard to say. I, I you know I. I, I'd be shocked if anybody uh, in Intel definitively knows what uh, 5G looks like at this point. Well, certainly it begs the question for a follow-up conversation around what is 5G. Certainly people will argue uh, um, what that means in terms of bandwidth, but you know, the question we had on theCUBE yesterday is you know, what apps are even ready for you know, a gigabit and what does that mean? Is that fixed wireless? Is that mo true mobility? Is that latency versus bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera? You know, the debate will rage on. Honestly, I just want to see more bandwidth. I love connectivity. So, um, all right, Scott, thanks so much for taking the time. I've got to ask you a final question. You know, what's the best party so far in Barcelona? What's the best tapas you've had? What's the what's the scene like uh, in and around town? What's what's some of the buzz? Uh, well, you know, I haven't been to any big parties to tell you the truth. I've mostly been to private dinners, but um, you know, the food is amazing. Yeah. You know, and, and so is the wine. So uh, you know, you can't, it's pretty hard to go wrong in Barcelona. It's probably like a uh, a foodie's paradise, I would say. Yeah, it certainly is. When we, we were there last time, it was amazing. Great, great gothic vibe there. Great little restaurants. Scott Rainovich here inside the Cube, and um, you know, Scott, you got some new new credentials here. You are still at Reno on Twitter, but you now have a, a new firm called Futurum. F U T U R I O M uh, Research. Congratulations. Futurium. Yeah. Ethereum, so uh, appreciate it, and thanks for taking the time, and, and I want to give you a shout out on the new gig, and, and you'll be hosting for theCUBE at the Open Networking Summit, ONS, uh, coming up. Appreciate that, and thanks for calling in and sharing the insight, what's happening in Spain and Barcelona for Mobile World Congress. Thanks so much. Thanks, John, it's great. Thanks for uh, having the CUBE cover this stuff. Great. Good stuff. We'll be back with more after this short break. This is special two days coverage inside the studios in Palo Alto live here in California, breaking down what's happened in Barcelona with all the news, the analysis,